The Milwaukee Road as an entity is gone, but it lives on in such things as this restored 484 steam locomotive. It's one of 10 iron horses built in 1944 to meet the growing demands of World War II. The Milwaukee Road also lives on at Milwaukee's Central Library. You'll find a few artifacts on display here, but for many railroad historians and hobbyists, the main interest is the library's Milwaukee Road archive, a special collection preserving a part of railroad history. Well, the railroad itself uh, actually was chartered in 1847. The construction began a year or two later, and its first formal operation was between Milwaukee and Wauwatosa in November of 1850. By 1851, the Milwaukee Road's first locomotive had expanded to Waukesha, its original goal, to Prairie du Chien by 1857, and the West Coast by 1909. In, in doing research, we very often dig into uh, stuff like this. The stuff includes a complete collection of passenger train timetables, personnel records that show their age, photographs of all kinds. Scribbins volunteer work here as a natural. He worked for the railroad for over 30 years, has written several books, and helped start the archive, the third largest collection of railroad material in the country. Members of the Milwaukee Road Historical Association also volunteer to catalog and preserve the railroad history. The group has over 2,500 members from throughout the world. It's almost like an addiction. It's really kind of funny. Once you get into it, you can't get out of it. And that's, that's how I, I came, came upon it. Um, railroading and trains have a real fascination for people. Uh, some people like the whistles and have multiple recordings of train whistles. And then there are people that love uh, pictures and have slides. And then there are the modelers who try to replicate on a different scale the, the train they saw. Um, starting out was a little hard because we had multiple boxes with all kinds of things that we had no idea what was in the boxes. And then we started going through the boxes and they were just like opening treasure chests. It was wonderful. The Everett Street Station, just south of Michigan Street at 3rd, was the local home for the Milwaukee Road. It opened in 1887 closed in 1965 when the new Amtrak station was built. The railroad dominated the Menominee Valley for many years. Construction of the railroad shops began in 1879. By the late 1930s, almost 3,000 people worked there. The Milwaukee Road was an innovator, using electric locomotives on mountain routes in three western states, operating high-speed intercity passenger trains. It also had an enormous impact on the development of this city. Milwaukee grew because of the railroad and the Milwaukee industry grew because of that. Uh, the Milwaukee Railroad was probably the biggest booster the city of Milwaukee ever had. Likewise, the railroad's fortunes or misfortunes ebbed and flowed uh, with the rise and decline of Milwaukee industry. The, the archive has thousands of engineering drawings of locomotives, rail cars, and stations. Over 20,000 have been indexed on computers. In the archive, we have multiple drawings. These are uh, mechanical drawings. We can draw one um, engine from the ground up to every last bolt. You might ask why save a drawing without a bolt. Well, there are restorations of locomotives, so that's where that comes in. The apology that's made for any history is uh, that it demonstrates what happened. People have a natural curiosity about the past. And a philosopher uh, once said that uh, those that don't learn the lessons of the past are condemned to repeat it. And I think the Milwaukee Road can, in effect, teach some ways.
Jim before was referring to the economic difficulties of the 60s and 70s, which uh, served much to drive the railroad out of business and a good deal of uh, heavy industry out of Milwaukee. I think if that were thoroughly explored, I think there might be some lessons to be learned. Questions about any railroad may be referred to the Milwaukee Public Library Humanities Department. The archive is available to the public, but access is limited. Some people, uh, uh, quite well-meaning of course, uh, come with a question, uh, send me everything you have about the Milwaukee Road, and uh, that of course is, is not possible. So we try to find out what their real interests are by means of this questionnaire, and uh, then we respond to that, mainly through the mails. Although local people or people who want to come from afar, if we do have advance notice, we can put materials out at the humanities desk so that can be viewed. In 1985, the reorganized Milwaukee Road was acquired by the Sioux Line, which subsequently became part of the Canadian Pacific system. The Everett Street Depot site now supports a Wisconsin Electric Office building. The railroad shops in the valley are closed. The Chicago, Milwaukee, St. Paul and Pacific was indelibly linked in the public mind as the Milwaukee Road, and railroad buffs say it's important that its history be preserved. Entire railroad industry in all parts of the country played uh, a tremendous role in the development of the United States and changing it from an agricultural nation to an industrial nation. Uh, that would not have happened without the railroads and too many times uh, the world at large overlooks that. It's important that we do have a place for all these things. Um, it's a big boom for Milwaukee. It, it's, it's a big boom for Milwaukee because Milwaukee was the heart of Milwaukee Road. The illustration on this poster depicts the ornate St. Saba Serbian Orthodox Cathedral, a major landmark in this semi-suburban neighborhood. Yeah, this church was built in Byzantine style, and you can notice from looking from outside that there are five domes, uh, four smaller ones and one center one, biggest one. Symbolically, uh, the biggest one symbolizes Jesus Christ, and those four four apostles uh, who wrote the uh, Gospels. More on the church later. The neighborhood is part of a large tract of land that once was an area for farming and logging. Area resident Ginger Schmidt has compiled a history of the area. And probably the most prominent people in this particular area was General Billy Mitchell's father. He owned a lot of the property from 43rd to 60th and Lincoln to Cleveland. Senator John Mitchell bought his land in 1878, built a mansion in that same year and called it Meadowmere. The home at 53rd and Lincoln is now a nursing home and assisted living facility called Mitchell Manor. German immigrant Frederick Hegelmeyer was here before Mitchell. His barn still exists at 52nd and Forest Home Avenue remodeled several times, the last in 1960 during a widening of the street. The 51st and Oklahoma intersection marks the southeast corner of White Manor subdivision. That was named after a gentleman who bought 80 acres from this Mr. Hegelmeyer, and at one time it was called White Manor Estates. And on 53rd and 54th there still remains white picket fences on the corner, but all the neighbors had, all the corners had these white picket fences, but those are the only two left. Even though it started in 1939, it wasn't really developed to, from 1945 to 55. And in 1951, it was known as White Manor Park, and it was still part of Green, the city of Greenfield. The subdivision was fully annexed by Milwaukee by 1953 and continued to grow. As the neighborhood grew, so did its institutions. The 55th Street School is the city's Spanish language immersion program. 
Oklahoma Avenue Lutheran Church erected its present structure in 1953. The area's Catholics built St. Gregory the Great in 1957. At the same time, the Serbian community completed St. Saba, one of only three cathedrals in the city. In 1912, a group of Serbian people met and they didn't organize sports club or men's club. They organized church school congregation. And they bought one small church on the corner of in, uh, National Avenue and Third Street. After World War II, many Serbs were forced to leave Yugoslavia because they were fighting against Nazis and communists. So Milwaukee uh, welcomed many of those and the Serbian community became much bigger and stronger. In 1946, they bought 14 acres of this land, which was woods. Early church members weren't happy with the decision by then pastor Milan Barkic. Because people said, what are you doing to us, taking us out of city, somewhere in the farms? But he knew what he's doing. Serb Memorial Hall was built in 1949 as a community center for Serbs but it quickly became much more. A gathering place for weddings, union meetings, Friday fish fries, and a center for political events. Bolstered by its success, the Serbian community began to build its new church. Inside, the church is covered with mosaics, icons of biblical figures and Serbian saints. I will take this opportunity to tell you a couple of words of the reasons why Orthodox Church keeps the icon in. Only God can be worshipped, nothing and nobody else. So we don't worship icons, but we keep them in the church. One of the reasons is I have a photograph of my father, my mother, my grandfather, my brothers. I love them and I would like to have image of them to be seen sometimes or all the time. So why not to have image of St. George, St. John the Baptist, and many others. In the beginning of Christianity, I would say 95% of members couldn't read or write, but each icon is like open book of the scriptures. Lions Park in the heart of the old Hegelmeyer farm is the largest area of green space in the neighborhood. It's named for Willard Lyons, a county supervisor for 30 years and the uncle of John Doyne, the first Milwaukee County executive. The neighborhood Serbian Center, 55th Street School, and other institutions are metropolitan resources. But the St. Sava, White Manor area remains a community of homes, with residents not unlike those who first settled here. They just wanted to make a better life for themselves. The members of St. Sava community are very happy and thankful for opportunities given them uh, by this beautiful city. Calling the budget fair, responsible, and innovative, Mayor Norquist signed the 2000 budget Thank in you. a city hall ceremony attended yep. by a number of city council members. Yeah, right. okay. The budget calls for a property tax rate of $9.69 per thousand dollars of assessed value, two cents below the current budget. Getting there wasn't easy. I, I've been here in the budget office for nine years, and I can honestly say I have not seen a budget quite like this one. Langhoff says the budget was typical in some ways, but offered new challenges, the greatest of which was uncertainty. On the typical side, we were, we were faced with ways to reduce taxes, to, to lower the tax burden on city residents while still continuing to provide a high level of services, the kind of services that, that, that uh, Milwaukee's citizens have come to uh, expect and uh, deserve based on what they pay. Uh, on, the, on the unexpected side, we had a number of issues come up. Among the issues which caused uncertainty for the budget office, pension matters. Would the dispute be settled? How much would it cost? The state adopting its budget three months later than expected. The governor vetoing millions of dollars in state aids. As it turned out, the mayor and the council 
worked together when, when we, we failed to get as much as we anticipated. And they worked together to, to forge a, a, a good, equitable solution to, to fill that gap. And I think it all worked out for the best. Remember as you pay your taxes that the bill you receive from the city also contains the bills of five other units of government. About a third of your dollar, 32 cents, goes for city services. Milwaukee Public Schools take another third, Milwaukee County gets 19 cents, MATC's portion is 7 cents, the Sewerage District gets 6 cents, and a penny goes for a state forestry tax and the Regional Planning Commission. Overall, the combined tax rate for the year 2000 bill is lower than the current budget, led by a significant reduction in the portion controlled by the Milwaukee public school system. The net rate for city residents is 23 cents lower than the 99 budget. The reduction saves the owner of a $70,000 home about $16. The goal is always to maintain the quality of services while keeping costs under control. The mayor has worked very closely with the council and the council has been very supportive of those efforts. They've, uh, they've helped the mayor keep taxes down and again, as I said earlier, that's really critical, I think, for city residents. The city budget includes no property tax increase but includes an increase in the sewer fee paid by all users of the system. Officials say an average household will pay about one dollar more per month. The library's bookmobile stays in service as the council again decided to retain it. City parking checkers will move from the police department to the Department of Public Works. The council rejected an idea to abolish the city's night parking permit system. The budget continues Milwaukee's nationally recognized lead abatement program to protect children before lead poisons their blood. It adds 125 new computers to city libraries to improve access to the internet for people who don't have home computers. The city property tax rate, once among the highest in the county, is now among the lowest, and that's important for economic growth, to attract new business. It's critical for us to, to be competitive, to remain competitive, otherwise those people will, will find some place that will offer them what they need at a lower cost, and, and that's where they'll go. Money collected from the property tax pays for only a small portion of the city's services. 44% of revenue comes in the form of state aids. Residential property taxes bring in 13%, commercial property taxes another 10%. 22% comes from earnings on investments, other grants and aids, and the tax stabilization fund provide the rest of the revenue. Public safety gets most of the money, 41% of the budget, 28% goes to public works. General government services need 12% of the tax dollar. Neighborhoods and development get 10%, health 5%, and 4% goes to culture and recreational programs. The budget office will begin to work on the 2001 budget next February with the same goals as this budget. To try and keep costs under control, to, to make sure that departments uh, deliver as much bang for the buck as they possibly can. Hey, how are you doing? Fine. Are you the vice principal here? No. Oh, I thought maybe you were the principal or the vice principal. <laughs> It was a warm day in November when school superintendent Spence Corte visited Cooper Elementary School on the far south side. It's something he does on a regular basis, with the informal visits a way for him to talk to administrators, teachers, school staffs, and students about what's happening in their school. With a student photographer documenting the visit, Dr. Corte sat down with two youngsters from the Cooper School student newspaper. Among the questions, do you like to sleep late on the weekends? How long have you been superintendent? Actually, my wife said I couldn't be the superintendent if I canceled our vacation. That's how I got the vacation. That type of self-deprecating humor has marked the tenure of the superintendent, who's been with MPS for 25 years, 14 as a principal. What is the most interesting part of your job as a superintendent? Well, the part I like the best is visiting the schools because when I was a principal, I never got to see anybody else's school. Now I'm seeing probably two or three schools a week. 
each school um, actually has its own personality and um, its own set of problems. So I really need to try to understand uh, uh, by walking through is probably the best way. I need to understand what kind of problems there are and what kind of opportunities. And um, it's more fun than being in the office. Corte has no children of his own, but feels he has 103,000 children, the number of kids in the public school system. And while he's learning about the schools, he says he also learns from the children. Yeah, you really do. Um, in this school, you see a lot of kids with the various uh, ethnic backgrounds getting along really well. I was impressed with the kids on the playground, the sharing. Um, it's kind of a microcosm of what our society could be if uh, the adults would learn from the children. The president of the Milwaukee School Board says he's pleased so far with the appointment. The administration team selected by the superintendent and the progress being made in the system. There are a number of, of new projects that are happening that probably wouldn't have happened before. I think the, the move to more charter schools and more decentralization, the neighborhood schools initiative, and the emphasis on, on uh, improving the quality of the principals are all, all things that the board wanted to do, but uh, were, are much easier now than before. Thompson says there will be a continued focus on principal and teacher quality as the board continues to assess the superintendent's performance. Well, I think at some point we, we have to go back and, and look at what's actually happening with the children. It's too, too early. You know, I would like to, and it's not quite happening yet, but to start seeing a reversal of the out-migration that's gone on. Um, I'd also like to, to really see the achieving schools spread you know, throughout the district. Uh, that's going to take a while, but uh, you know, that's, that's the bottom line. The, the issues of, of how we serve all the children in the, in the community is uh, probably the, the most, you know, the crucial one when we get back to that. Um, and that comes down to, you know, there are a whole, whole bunch of families who can afford to move out or pay for private schools who we would like to win back. And then we have a number of students who are, you know, come from very challenging backgrounds and we need to figure out strategies to meet their needs. There are more than 6,000 teachers in the Milwaukee Teachers Education Association, and they too are keeping a close eye on the superintendent's performance. I think it's really been too soon to assess it because once you start implementing programs or changes, you usually don't see the effect of it for at least a year. One of the things that I am not in favor of is um, the attention that our central service pays toward choice and charter schools. I feel that the attention should be paid toward improving MPS instead of what's happening in the choice and charter schools. That's where the focus needs to be. Copeland says smaller class sizes and more materials are on the wish list of the union. And she hopes Dr. Corte and other central administration staff will continue to visit schools and investigate their needs in depth. By going into the schools, finding what needs to be done, and acting on that, I think that would be the best thing that could happen to our system. You know, any type of reform takes place at the individual school, one school at a time. It doesn't take place at central service. I've talked with them on many occasions, and I, I really think that we can work together to improve the system. He seems to be very concerned about children, which is the first step. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to working with him um, as often as possible. I, I think we could do a lot of things, positive things, for the benefit of the children of our system. About a third of Milwaukee public schools have active parent-teacher associations. They are represented at the central office by the Council of PTAs. The idea that the PTA has so far is we do have a good working relationship with him, but we're looking for ways to strengthen uh, right now. We uh, want to work to make sure that all the children of MPS are well represented. The Council of PTA says it hopes the superintendent and central office staff will help with what the group sees as a major challenge. More parent representation at the school level. And how can you do that? 
by opening up the doors to MPS and inviting parents to come in and welcome them. Do you feel that's not being done now? Not enough. What can parents do? Parents bring a lot of ideas to the table. And the only way you can find out what they want is invite them. I think uh, Superintendent Spence Corte is doing a good job. Uh, I think he's still in the honeymoon period of the job. So I think he's, you know, basically trying to get used to all the policy and procedure and all the politics that go along with the position. Uh, as a PTA, I think it's imperative that we continue our involvement with the superintendent as we have in the past with other superintendents so that we can strengthen that relationship so that he can understand where we're coming from as well as understanding what his goals are so that we can work with him in helping him to achieve some of these goals. That's, you know, what's best for our children of Milwaukee Public Schools. Roxanne, a past president of the Council of PTAs, also says more parents need to become involved with MPS. That involvement is important, not only for them, but for their children, because when their children see them involved, they, they achieve and their grades go up. So it's an all-around situation that all of us need to work together and take that next step to be involved in our children's education. Cooper is one of 160 schools in the public school system. The superintendent says he'll continue to visit them and, as he has for 25 years, work to better the education of Milwaukee's school children. What are you guys reading? Uh, is it fun? Yeah. I think I read that one, but I won't tell anybody about how it ends. <laughs> but I think you'll like it. <laughs> Reading's fun, isn't it? Yeah. Great. Thank you for all the hard work. Oh, sure. We appreciate it. We, under, we understand that the hard work gets done in the classroom, not in the boardroom. Right. Well, Great. you guys have a lot of work for that. Nice to meet you. You guys <laughs> keep up the good work.